Bonjour à tous. Ravi. Good afternoon, everybody. We're delighted to have you here face to face in these Rencontres économiques d'Aix-en-Provence. We haven't uh, been able to come together for quite a time, so we have a special panel today on uh, impact finance. What is impact finance? What is it? Do we use it for? And how, in what way would it be decisive for the economic transition of the future? On this panel, we have uh, Mary Eakland. You worked in a business bank and investment bank. Uh, Julie Morgan, uh, Credit Agricole, before joining uh, an organization specialized in the funding of startups and to create your own fund. You also co founded the Moby France Digital in 2012 and participated in the success story of Critio in particular. On your right is Jean-Jacques Barberis from Amandi. You were a member of Pierre Moscovini's cabinet in, when he was Minister of the Economy and then an uh, economic councillor for uh, President Hollande. Since 2016, you've joined Amandi to manage the institutional branch ESG. On your right, we have Nicolas Gomal. You are general director of the Matmut Group. You began your career as a trader <clears throat> and you created an incubator, New Alpha, within the Interactive Investment Fund, ADI, and then you joined Matmut in uh, 2012, and you are now the CEO and have been since 2015. Uh, by my side, Alexandre Mars, you are the American person of the panel. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's positive or not. I'm just waiting to see what she says next. After a number of uh, startups, in particular in the United States, in 2014, you created uh, the uh, fund EPIC, which selects charitable organizations, in particular for education and childhood, and you fund donations thanks to your venture capital company, Bliss, which invests in startups such as Spotify, Pinterest, and uh, Food2Go. No, I think that was quite positive. Yeah, not bad, good start. A very good, uh, promising start of your career. And then finally, Olivier Lenel is uh, CEO of Mazar in France, a big auditing firm, uh, uh, fiscal issues uh, uh, you work on, and uh, 40,000 employees across the world, and you have been working there for 30 years. So the concept of impact investing appeared in 2007 in the United States upon a conference organized by the Rockefeller Foundation, but above all developed after the G8 of London in 2014. So to understand things more clearly, I will leave the floor to Marie-Françoise Renard, who is a professor in the University of Clermont-Auvergne and in charge of the Research Institute on China, the IDREC. Thank you. The theme of these rencontres, uh, uh, sees the future together, makes us think about the way in which we can uh, avoid crises to make sure they don't occur, even though this pandemic has really made us uh, understand uh, the weaknesses. And we understand that if we carry on in this way, we will have new pandemics due to deforestation, global warming. We know that there will be other viruses also. So we conclude that there must be breakthroughs of different natures. And finance impact uh, investment could be one of these breakthroughs because its in, uh, objective is to move from traditional funding to uh, funding that supports sustainable transformation. In its very in its official uh, definition itself, Im impact investment aims to serve the common good. The common good is a very broad notion. It's a notion that at the beginning uh, is religious, philosophical, and I think that if we each uh, took each of us here in the room, we would all have a very different idea of what the common good is. However, if we take an interest in common goods, in plural, that means goods that are necessary for the reproduction of life on Earth, we might have uh, tools that can help uh, impact investment to define its uh, scope and to support the success of uh, its projects. For a long time, we considered these common goods were water, air, uh, biodiversity, 
And uh, in recent years, as we're questioning ourselves as to the sustainability of our societies, their durability, their reproduction, this notion of common goods has extended out. And we can consider, for example, that access to health, access to education, access to decent housing are common goods. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of these current goods is that uh, economists talk about non-exclusion. For example, young people must not in the future be excluded from the consumption of pure air, must not be excluded from diversity. Vulnerable people should not be excluded from the labor market, should not be excluded from uh, obtaining decent housing. And therefore, the choice of a project can be enlightened by this notion of common goods, which can serve as a sort of uh, interpretation. So for a project to be admissible for impact investment, it must demonstrate the deliberate uh, will to have a positive and measurable impact and also, of course, to uh, have a yield that will attract investors and to convince savers. Today, the questions uh, that arise are multifold. What are the tools which are uh, susceptible to apprehend reality, to estimate impacts, and how can we organize this within distinct tools, for example, in terms of uh, tax, uh, tax issues and green uh, fiscality. We must, and this is the essential point, define a taxonomy that includes social considerations. And the definition of this taxonomy is key to give credibility to impact investment, to raise awareness among people who are turning to impact investment. And of course, this is the point which is extremely tricky. But I believe that if we succeed in doing this, it will be a true breakthrough, a, 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 a social breakthrough a societal breakthrough that will allow us to support the transition towards a new form of society, including a local dimension, which corresponds to the territorial dimension, which corresponds to a strong beha demand on behalf of the population, and which might also revive our democracy, which, as we see, is in dire need of re revival, allowing uh, individuals and citizens to be stakeholders of these projects and to provide them with the possibility. I was going to say impression, but it mustn't be just an impression of it, to give them the possibility of being fully fed stakeholders in these projects. And also, for the definition of these norms, there must be an international dimension. Norms can only hold meaning in this social and uh, environmental uh, area if it's on an international scale. For us, the international dimension is, first of all, the European dimension. And if Europe cannot manage to have a common policy, it can at least have common projects. And this could be a wonderful project. We know that Europe has already started to define and propose a certain number of norms in terms of green funding. And this could be another project in the same area. Therefore, we would engage both the responsibility interest of savers of the different uh, economic stakeholders to uh, make the move towards a, a society that is not mortgaging, mortgaging out the future. And we know that this is essential for the survival of societies. We're no longer developing societies, but uh, allowing them to survive. Thank you for listening to me. Alors, on aux femmes. Donc, nous allons... So, we are now going to give the floor to the other woman of this panel, Mary Eakland. In the last uh, uh, lockdown, uh, uh, you wrote uh, your last uh, paper. 2050 is the year of carbon neutrality. How do you think the Commons can feed uh, these projects? So, first of all, I, I was thinking of ecological positivity, because today uh, ecological neutrality is not sufficient. As Marie-Francoise said, we need to really set down the conditions for a sustainable future. And this is really what led us when we uh, began 
2050. How can we contribute in it? Invest of, of, of funding is not just predicting the future, we are fashioning the future. When we invest in one area rather than another, we're setting a, a direction and to contribute to the society in which we will be living in the coming years, in which our children will live after us. So the question is, what do we want to contribute to? So we did uh, take a step back and it was this initial uh, brick that really uh, gave rise to the innovation within 2050 uh, with an intentionality that uh, we started at the beginning, which was to say we want to contribute to fashioning a fertile future. Why fertile? Hence the positivity, because very clearly it must be productive, but also evolutive in order to adapt to all of the major environmental, technological, social changes that are underway. And also inclusive so that we can step out of this idea that uh, there is one solution for all, but rather to integrate uh, the specificity of each one in order to allow them to contribute. So that was our starting point. And this led us to consider the common good. And it was very interesting because setting with that point, that starting point, we thought, well, how can we manage to do this? <clears throat> and by writing an investment strategy that solves the problems or that seeks to solve them, how are we all going to feed ourselves, feed ourselves in a healthy manner by 2050? How can everybody take care of their mental and physical health? I'm not going to list them all, but we've uh, wrote down an investment strategy in this way. And we thought, well, it's not a, a question of just um, uh, solving these problems in a temporary manner, but uh, the companies that participate in uh, responding to these problems should not create new problems. Therefore, they must align their own economic interests with the interests of society and the planet as a whole, which boils down to saying private and the commons. And so in saying this, what we realize is that it's very easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to do is that we created, we participate in, we live in a system which, in a rather structural manner, uh, encourages alignment. So, I like to mention the example of Netflix to illustrate this. The founders of Netflix, uh, Rita Sting, says, My main competitor is sleep. And it so happens that the day he said that, I just read a book which called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, who is a researcher in sleep and who demonstrated the extent to which the fact that each individual uh, creates uh, problems of uh, public health because they sleep less, because there are more road accidents, uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, incidents, etc. So we see how uh, sleep deprivation uh, uh, contributes to this and we need to help companies therefore to align so they can participate in an ecosystem which is aligned in this manner. So when we raise the question of ecosystem and this alignment and we think uh, in terms of value change, we see uh, that uh, not all of the bottlenecks can be s solved by uh, companies. When we look at the entire food chain, there is a demand uh, that is not satisfied on behalf of the consumers for more responsible organic products that better uh, compensate farmers and feed animals and they create a, 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 they're very success they create big sexes like to go and uh, be on meat and th there is this but um, upstream of the uh, chain the type of uh, bottleneck we we find cannot be solved by companies but by the commons meaning uh, argumentation research and uh, this means that in our own st investment strategy, we dedicate 10% of the funds to fund strategic commons that we believe will help the performance of our companies. In the same way as Elon Musk in 2013 made all of Tesla's patents public, what he was saying is, I, my, my competitor are not the other automobile manufacturers, electric automobile manufacturers. I need my own ecosystem to move ahead quickly and it moves ahead alongside me and I contribute to this. But it is the, uh, it is the uh, traditional engine um, uh, manufacturers that will benefit from it. And so today he has funded uh, uh, something that will uh, allies public and private interests and that's what means that we will have we're stepping out of the idea that there are winners and losers we must open up to the idea that both can gain by uh, working together thank you Marie we have another very concrete example Alexander Alexander you have your venture capital company bliss how does bliss position itself as a stakeholder of impact investment and do you sleep 
uh, not enough. So I'm very concerned when I hear Marie uh, saying this. And I said, well, I've uh, lost more than 15 minutes sleep. But that's the problem of being an entrepreneur. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit your health, I think. It, it depends on your choice. It, you might uh, favor a family. But uh, I didn't want to sacrifice my family, but uh, my sleep has suffered. So what you're saying has suffered me. Uh, my, my wife uh, asked me three times to read this book, and I refused to read it. So impact investment, that is a term that we use a lot. Uh, if we ask the 100% people here, we probably all have a, a different definition of invest, uh, impact investment. Our definition is that it supports entrepreneurs that have a positive image of what they will be able to generate. So it might be somebody uh, with a mission, a uh, company with a mission, but the idea is that these entrepreneurs were at the basis of value creation today and in the future. How do we support them? But if we do this, we said, we necessarily, uh, our results must be better than those of the market. Because if we do funding with this vision and we underperform, there will always be people who said, oh, we told you so, it doesn't work. And we've been doing this for seven years. We have 38% of net uh, uh, feedback on investment. But we have this return, uh, not because we do this uh, after, but because we do this first and because we managed to support these uh, entrepreneurs that have a, a quite incredible impact. Marie was talking about this too good to go because uh, we uh, it's one of the projects we've uh, supported. It's a type of impact company. They don't define their success. So that's interesting. Who knows too good to go in the in the room? Yeah, there's a real culture of the common good uh, and uh, in excess here. But it's interesting because too good to do to go do not define their success in revenue, but in number of meals saved. So that is incredible, and it's very rare. A company that is now established throughout Europe and is going to try and penetrate the American market. So our vision of impact investment is not a vision where we imagine very strong results. But of course, behind that, there must be missions carried by the entrepreneurs we support. Ourselves, as an investment fund, uh, are obliged to follow the same line. We're the first uh, bigger uh, transatlantic fund. We invest 50% uh, of what we do in, in the States and in 50% in Europe. But this is very important for us as well. If we look at people who work with us, 20% of the bonuses they will have are redistributed to uh, social courses, 50% of their time. So in the world of finance, we can no longer say and not do in any case on these subjects. So we must be perfectly aligned. And this is what Marie does extremely well with uh, 2050. So this will be important in the world of the future. And I think there's a question here, and that is the common good. Uh, for me, it is a, an almost philosophical question, the, the, these common goods. Is it the economy that's at the base of society or is it the contrary? And when we look at this, this resonates with the question of the usefulness of a mission. And uh, this brings us to a perfect circle because we're talking about entrepreneurship. What we see today is that entrepreneurs have changed. Entrepreneurs have changed. Why? Because we have all changed. And today we've changed as consumers. And uh, even uh, those that we're uh, talking about, even five, ten years ago, m m either we couldn't, it was inaudible or there was not very, a great deal of interest. But today they carry this mission. And that's why we see a number of entrepreneurs who will engage in this and will be interested in receiving uh, funds from us. Because when they have a, a choice of a, a, a company that has a mission such as ours or, who, who, or another whose only mission is to make a profit, of course, they will uh, choose people such as ourselves. And that's a very good thing. Thank you, Alexander. Nicolas Dumas. So this virtuous circle, maybe you are the living incarnation of this with the mutualist uh, principle of the matmut, the principle of the insured insurer. So is this mutualist principle, can this contribute to this transition to the improvement of uh, common goods. Yes, I do believe this. Uh, uh, the living incarnation, you're very kind of saying it, but we try to do our best indeed. I do indeed uh, have the feeling that the structure that I manage is part of a group, the mutual insurances that are very modern, considering what I've just heard. 
very modern in the way in which they uh, go about their business. Why? Quite simply because you know that a mutual insurance is an organization whose governance is uh, the direct emanation of its members meaning its customers. So we do not have any stakeholders in a mutual insurance. And as we have no stakeholders, we have no dividends to, uh, to, to give to the stakeholders. So mutual insurances obviously generate profits. Why? Because they have to ensure their future development. But these are not subject to the same constraints as a capital uh, company, which uh, firstly allows it to redistribute uh, a part of the profits more easily, and above all, to have a long-term vision, which is a considerable advantage today. So this model was specifically designed, I believe, to in the service of the community of members, um, uh, because they're mutual insurances, but also in the general philosophy related to this idea that the company must contribute to the common good, which is what we said. So concretely, as far as we are concerned, we have a number of manners in, of contributing. There is our CSR. Um, uh, we are involved in uh, health. We fund a number of health uh, organizations, in particular a, a, a hospital a center of excellence in Paris. We have a number of programs that allow certain uh, populations to access to culture, to knowledge, elements of the common good. And a third element uh, related to uh, sustainable development that go through our investments, and I'll come back to that. But even in our activity as an insurer, which is at the core, our core activity, we uh, accompany the societal evolutions towards uh, the ecological transition regarding mobility, uh, carpooling, etc. We propose uh, products that facilitate this type, new type of mobility. Also, regarding the repairs, we repair. Uh, we compensate uh, drivers that have uh, accidents and we organize the repair chain. So there are different ways of going about this. Um, we can uh, smooth out the bumps without uh, redoing the painting. We manage the waste, uh, um, uh, everything related to the repair. All of this is in, within a process that is resolutely directed at the common good, the common good of the community of uh, members. That's our number one objective, but also beyond. And finally, regarding the financial aspects, of course, an insurer is a structural investor. Uh, for Matmut, uh, it represents almost 6 billion euros that we invest. And uh, with our company that manages our finances, we are resolutely committed to a sustainable uh, process, meaning in uh, 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 to the Paris Agreement and maintaining the uh, temperature trajectory well below two degrees by 2100, uh, zero oil by 2050, uh, progressively pulling out a non-convention non uh, gas uh, and electricity uh, by 2030, etc. So there are also these ways which are very concrete uh, ways and no doubt effective ways in the in the medium term in any case of contributing to this necessarily evolution which is that of the adaptation to climate change on behalf of our world and society so a lot of different uh, aspects and a very strong commitment we talk a, a lot about raison d'etre today in our companies and somewhere uh, the mutual insurers for us in particular defining the raison d'etre is almost an oxymor but it's not an oxymor to the contrary it's a pleonasm um, meaning that it is part of the initial ge genetics of the structure. And if we are doing it this year uh, by calling upon our members um, uh, with a consultation of about 250,000 people to get, obtain their idea of what they're expecting from our company, if we're doing it this year, it is to formalize it. But deep down, it has existed since the very creation of the company, meaning 60 years ago now. Thank you, Nicolas. Jean-Jacques Barberis, you see the financial stakeholders every day making these commitments uh, to the ecological transition. 
uh, more or less successfully. Can you explain, first of all, to talk to us about uh, uh, impact investment and how this is included in the big uh, assets class? And uh, has the COVID uh, maybe been a catalyzer? Well, thank you very much. I tried not, I'm going to try not to uh, uh, break the atmosphere, but quite clearly, Marie and Alexandre are islands in an ocean of traditional funding, which so far has not uh, undertaken its mutation so far. I just want to make sh uh, say that clearly. And as the professor said about England, and England is a, a country surrounded by water. And today, impact investment is small, very tiny in the universe of uh, uh, major actor, traditional actors. But I agree entirely with what Alexander said. Five years ago, if we'd had this conversation, not here because the rencontre dex are at the cutting edge, but in the financial world, talking about responsible investment and uh, impact in five, ten years' time, was very has been very French and almost a, a left wing. And what we see today is that even the Americans are, are, are starting to take an interest in it. So it shows that there's something that's happened. In the cultural battle, something has partially been won. We've gained some ground. But what is it at the heart of the subject for uh, the big financial animal of our kind that manages a large amount of money, about 1.8 trillion euros? The idea is how we take these concepts uh, into the world of traditional finance. We will never do everything as well in detail uh, locally as we do as funds such as Marie and Alexandre manage, but we have a scale up potential, and that's what we need to look for, and that's the subject. And the question to Sent is today, can we say that we will at last start scaling things up, in particular on the question of impact? Because there are lots, but this is the fundamental question the question of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And to a certain extent, I'm a rather pessimistic person by nature, but I do think that some signals are going in the right direction. First of all, since the Paris Agreement in Europe, uh, uh, US2 finances have uh, limits, but in the first quarter of this year, they've become, uh, they represent one third. So they, uh, uh, they are now a, a, a majority. That's a quite a, a breakthrough in the financial system. And today, as there is not a single day uh, where a, a, a financial player doesn't take a commitment to be net zero in 2030, I think that things will go very quickly. And I will just illustrate this with a single figure because I think it's useful to have this in mind. It's very all very good to take commitments for 2050, but 2050 is a, a long time way to go. But we have to take uh, long-term commitments. But uh, with regard to the asset holders that have approved and what they've approved as objectives, by 2025, we have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas uh, um, effects in the portfolios between a minus 20 and minus 25 percent. So in the, uh, the European economy, so if companies uh, respect their commitments and the states respect their commitments, that's a lot of hypothesis, but we're more at around minus 13, minus 14. So the leap that has to be achieved is major, it's massive leap. And this will have an effect if people are serious and if they do it properly and try and do it properly, it will be absolutely gigantic on the price of the assets. So I don't think today we measure the impact that this will have on the cost of corporate capital and the value of the actions of the companies involved. And that makes me relatively optimistic and that will go very fast. Olivier, you're going to have a work. You've got a lot of work to do in Basel to measure this impact. Uh, no doubt. So the difficulty is, of course, how do we concretely measure this impact? What are the criteria? You do the audits, the financial consulting for companies. How can we concretely collect this non-financial data and to really have criteria with which to measure the impact? Well, I'm delighted to be with you today, uh, talking about a topic that is vast and very ambitious. And as a, as a citizen and as a professional, I think that we have an obligation to achieve results today, and you're all aware of this. It's a subject that resonates within Mazar because we are exp living our role as a third party of uh, trustful party 
Uh, we have a raison d'etre today, which is to contribute to the construction of a prosperous and sustainable world in our field, of course, with a great deal of humility and a great deal of determination. I can uh, do advertising for Too Good To Do, but we were at the origin of an initiative of Too Good To Do. Uh, with regard to the, the leftovers of the cateens in La Défense business area. So this uh, subject resonates also among our teams uh, whose average age is 28, 29, and they see a um, very powerful meaning in this. We've just published a very recent white paper on building the crisis exit and the expectations of companies with regard to the companies. And this white paper offers a reflection on responsible uh, profitability which requires a better balance between performance and impact, and which deserves uh, more investment and, no doubt, a great deal of innovation. Just a figure to illustrate this white paper for 88% of French people in our panel, a little bit over 2,000 French people, which were representative, uh, they uh, uh, have this profile. So on this impact, uh, impact investment and the measure of indicators and impact that has followed, this is the basic, que the essential question today. And I have three main messages to share with you this afternoon. The first is, uh, it's a good news. Uh, it's good news, but I've heard that the uh, scale of impact investment. I'm speaking of responsible invest. This movement of responsible investment is well underway. Uh, the tone of the top is there, you follow it regularly, and today it is very clear that the financial players are uh, have, must engage in a resilient and sustainable funding, and fairer as well. We see uh, many initiatives, a lot of experiments, a lot of uh, uh, transparency. I'll give you two examples. Du site. Sure. Uh, visit uh, Finance for Tomorrow, you will see the Observatory of uh, Sustainable Finance. And I can tell you that there are some commitments and achievements uh, made uh, for green finance, sustainable finance, responsible finance, the exiting coal, a carbon transition. There's another example. The Financial Market Authority has published a study on climate reporting and the implementation of a repository that is quite authoritative, the TCRD, 10 financial uh, financiers. So our uh, financial players have recognized what we do regarding mobilization, transparency as well. And there are some restrictions uh, due to the uh, complexity of uh, climate reporting, uh, taking into account uh, the prospective studies and the uncertainties. Second message that I would like to deliver to you, a complexity. So uh, complexity of the uh, topic, it's a topic that is quite uh, broad. Uh, we have to be ambitious. There are interconnected uh, aspects, intermingled aspects. So it's a matter of uh, striking the right equilibrium with uh, some contradictory objectives, environmental objectives, societal uh, objectives. You have to consider consider the sequence of events, uh, measures are taken and uh, they will bear fruit in the long term. So there are lots of uh, uh, contradiction, contradictions. You have lots of uh, players who are quite uh, numerous. So it's a factor of complexity and information is complex. And uh, tr transparency of information is complex. Why? Because there are lots of repositories on these uh, topics. A third message that I would like to put out to you, uh, uh, of course, there are lots of rich and fruitful contributions. Uh, 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 it, it's important to standardize uh, uh, data, ESGA data produced by investors and companies. There is no such thing of uh, 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 there is no such thing um, as uh, 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 sustainable finance if people can't understand themselves. So it's important to produce uh, quality data, robust data, reliable data. This is what is at stake with the uh, European Directive uh, to manage information production that is qualitative with uh, standards. 
and uh, this uh, sustainability reporting should be made available to more than 50 companies in Europe. It's a matter of uh, summarizing all the initiatives, all the international initiatives and repositories that are implemented, uh, taxonomy, uh, SFRD. It's important I mean, to identify uh, some specific mechanisms uh, for the uh, small and medium-sized companies. And um, you would be surprised if I wouldn't tell you that all these data have to be audited, because when you have data that is audited, you can make progress without any reporting. It's very difficult to measure the impact. Mary, you are interested in the transformation of a product. Uh, why uh, technology uh, can help you to transform the product? Uh, can you uh, elaborate on that, please? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, it's not simply a matter of indicators. It's further than that. Uh, for example, uh, indicators are a way to measure. So they are pivotal. But when you think about the transformation of company in order to abide by the new rules of a game, to adapt itself to the new rules of a game in order to take up the challenges and find solutions, uh, what we've noticed and is that this uh, calls into question governance of the products and many other things. It's not simply a, a matter of measuring what we do. It also necessitates our modus operandi, our ways of working. So when we thought about it, how can we get a fertile future, we change the investment strategy. It means that we need to found ecosystems. So we will uh, devote part of the fund to found uh, common good, but uh, we need to use the benefit of time. There are lots of uh, 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 projects that are not well aligned because there was a time frame that is set for the strategy of entrepreneurs. So that's why we uh, thought about an open fund. With an open fund, uh, there is more leeway uh, for companies. They can focus on the long haul. They can uh, invest, and we try to reinvest. So uh, we uh, found uh, businesses, but uh, there's another factor whereby uh, people are not aligned. Of course, we want to make the most of the uh, value created. But uh, if we are governed by shareholders whose uh, sh goal is not to reach uh, objectives, and if there is no alignment between the private good and the common good, uh, things will uh, turn awry. So how things uh, can uh, be managed? So we are governed by a sustainability fund, and we uh, we we changed the governance of the company and we changed the financial procedure because of the type of financial products they don't exist it's an open fund that is quite specific and we are not the shareholders of our company we decided to give up that for example there's a dynamics of innovation for entrepreneurs uh, who have uh, succeeded. The need for consumers, employees to change their professional choices and to uh, uh, something that we've observed as well with uh, uh, individual investors. 76% of millennials have said that they would invest in projects that will not harm the planet. And these new millennials, they have uh, some assets, they have some net worth. So there is uh, some momentum coming from people. And uh, this momentum, that is uh, key uh, for uh, consumption. So entrepreneurs have decided to grasp uh, that uh, issue. Some entrepreneurs were successful in the past. Uh, we've just uh, 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 founded a company called Sweep, and they've understood uh, what was at stake regarding carbon footprint. Of course, it's not simply a matter of reducing uh, carbon. We need to recapture carbon uh, from the atmosphere in order to be on a 1.5 trajectory. So they decided to focus on the question. They noticed that we had an issue with the industrial industrialization of technologies. Why uh, was it difficult to industrialize? The small scale solutions couldn't be funded by entrepreneurs. So they said that uh, carbon credits uh, should be earmarked towards uh, these companies. 
companies when they turned to the corporate. But of, of course, the first problem was uh, to measure the emissions. It was not a matter of remarking things. And they focused on sectorial proxies. So they built a solution, they, sh they designed a solution which, from a technological point of view, made it possible to manage uh, traveling expenses. I mean, uh, carbon is like a PNL. When you have a, 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 a traveling expense, uh, you uh, uh, consider uh, the uh, carbon footprint. We can know where we uh, consume. Then we can create a, a marketplace. So. There are two uh, dimensions. First dimension, these successful entrepreneurs, they understand the challenges that we're facing. They try uh, to use their entrepreneurial skills to sort out some problems. Hence, there are technological solutions, and there are some changes to the governance system. So uh, uh, they have a mission committee. So they take that into account in their raison d'etre and in the way they behave, in the way they work. And uh, there is a new type of uh, companies uh, through technology, and that's uh, quite insightful. Thank you, Marie. Uh, Alexandre. Alexandre will be talking about the presidential campaign. What do you expect? Is it for me? Is it a question for me, says Alexandre? So if you may. I will give the floor to Nicola. Yes, Nicola, he wants to talk about uh, presidential elections. So, Nicola, by the way, you would like uh, to see uh, 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 green actions. What is the role of state as part of this uh, fresh transition? The role of, of the state, that's a very good question, a relevant question. And I can tell you that uh, this is a pervasive question in all the uh, debates and discussions. Uh, uh, the state is present. Uh, the state has never been so, so, so present, so involved. What is the role of a state? Uh, so, so as a, a boss, as a manager, I think that uh, regulations are nightmarish. Uh, they are nightmarish. Uh, there are lots of regulations. I mean, they are bound and they cost a fortune. Having said that, uh, I think that uh, we need to have regulations. Uh, regulations that w will manage the whole process, that will give some indications. So the role of a state is necessary to regulate in order to manage the big questions and issues, uh, climate uh, uh, problems or climate-related topics that are quite quite pervasive. The state has uh, an array uh, of actions uh, to embark upon, regulations, the uh, capacity to uh, unleash uh, capitals to set aside, to set aside uh, capitals, the next generation EU capitals launched in July 2020 with 40 billion uh, being earmarked uh, for that plan and taxation as well. I'm not going to dwell on those uh, topics, but I think that regarding investments, it is not up to the state to invest. Uh, it is up to the state to create the conditions for a favorable investments uh, by private operators. I don't believe in the ability of the state to invest. But conversely, there's a regulatory dimension that we need to take into account. So there's not a debate on no debate. Uh, uh, solvency to insurance companies have to abide by the requirements. It's a matter of taking into account the necessary equity for the business activities. There's a certain percentage of equity that should be earmarked uh, for investment. So if you invest 100 euros in terms of shares, you need between 39 and 40 percent of equity being marked. With, but uh, strategic investments are not included because they are taxed to the tune of 22 percent. I'm surprised to see that no politician has uh, uh, talked about that. So 
the 20% could be earmarked uh, to uh, green investment. So if we want to earmark capitals towards these uh, capitals, I mean, this is one of the means, and it will be painless uh, for public finance. Uh, some uh, surveys have uh, demonstrated that uh, this uh, type of investment uh, is less risky with a better uh, risk yield ratio. So it's uh, important to uh, apply a legitimate uh, capital taxation for these investments. It's quite easy to do that because uh, there are some elements that will uh, enable you to say that uh, uh, this investment is green and you have a taxonomy. V taxonomy, this is the battle that we need to wage. It's a way of defining and anchoring public policies. This is the starting point. So I reiterate my wish. So once again, we need to be committed to earmarking part of the capital for investments. OK, some people will say, that's OK, but this will lead to a poor allocation of capital because there will be bubbles uh, coming in, hence some problems. That's not totally wrong, but I think that the game is worth the candle. It's a, it's a one dollar for public finance, very easy to understand. And it's a message that can be conveyed to the politicians. Uh, uh, it's just a matter of doing things, but that's not the case in Europe. But I need that we need to put out that message. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicolas Olivier. So what do we not do regarding uh, ecological taxation? So the receipts, the earnings, 50 billion euros, uh, uh, 40 billion in terms of fees. Is there a problem of transparency? Is there a problem, an issue with uh, the number of taxes? What would you like to see changing? A call uh, to politicians, maybe. So regarding ecological taxation, there's a limitation, acceptance, acceptance. And I think uh, uh, I think uh, that was uh, uh, a glaring example of the uh, Yellow Vesta movement. Uh, of course, uh, measures are key uh, to uh, support transition. And uh, there's a driver that we can tap. So we can make a parallel with the uh, taxation of tobacco products. Of course, we support measures, but uh, the, uh, it was quite powerful. So if we are hooked to uh, uh, carbon, uh, there is a, an ongoing transition that needs to be well supported. And we need to work on the uh, different uh, signals. We talked about acceptance. Jean-Jacques Barbieris, uh, acceptance. So the Yellow Vest movement, uh, the Red Cap movement, uh, new taxes uh, for energy transition. How can we arouse uh, acceptance uh, for uh, new uh, policies? We talked about the how. We talked about the uh, common good. In the United Kingdom, uh, there was almost a revolution, a social acceptance. Uh, it is a fundamental uh, uh, issue in terms of transition for the presidential uh, elections. Uh, personally, I hope that social acceptance of transition should be at the heart of the debates. Laurent Berger uh, was in X. They've just uh, uh, talked about that. It's a fundamental uh, topic. It's not simply a matter for uh, politicians. It's a matter for investors to integrate the social aspects uh, uh, into a transition uh, policies. We launched a big coalition of investors for a fair transition. We represent only three uh, a trillion euros. So join us. We need people in order to have some clout. Uh, on companies. We want companies uh, to implement alignment plans uh, that uh, will embed the uh, social uh, dimensions. 
what could be the proposals uh, for the presidential elections. As an investor, I've noticed that uh, bosses and managers are sensitive to two things. They pay attention to the uh, price of shares and the uh, return uh, on shares. So in the governance uh, uh, system, we need to align uh, remuneration and incitement uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to to invest. So I think it's a good theme. We need to think about the alignment of remuneration the alignment of remuneration policies and alignment of general policies. Alexandre, what has changed recently on this topic and what would you like to see changing in the next five years? Uh, by, oh, I thought that you were about to ask me by May next year when the presidential election takes place. So two centuries ago, uh, Charles Darwin was born and uh, he, he forged their concept, the evolution of species, and I like him quite a lot. We uh, evolve because we want to survive. So when you don't understand uh, that process as a company, your uh, company will close down. Remember Nokia, 10 years ago, half of the people in a room uh, had a Nokia phone, 51% of market shares. It was in 2010, not a long time ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But Nokia has vanished into thin air. Uh, so uh, uh, companies have understood the process. Brice Rocher, our friend, uh, um, is uh, managing the Yves Rocher Group. And uh, the human size, the human uh, side, the human dimension has been uh, put at the forefront. So we need to do more. Uh, there are some tools that are being used. Uh, BCOR is a tool, but other tools could be highlighted. You have uh, to demonstrate that what you do should be aligned. So Darwin, uh, uh, I'm took Darwin uh, played a key role. So if we don't change, we won't be able to recruit people. So something that you've experienced on a daily basis, people don't work. Uh, for many companies, because these companies uh, are not uh, responsible. And uh, this is a trend that came to the four or five years ago. So for example, a young person, a young graduate, they, uh, young graduates, they want to do something else. They want to be entrepreneurs, but not only entrepreneurs. So these companies will fight uh, to uh, attract uh, uh, the talent. and and. People will have plenty of choice, and they have plenty of choice when it comes to uh, buying uh, an Apple phone. You have uh, some people who don't pay taxes. That's unacceptable. Uh, you think that it is uh, unacceptable, but you all have an Apple phone uh, in your pocket. So it's very difficult to align our values with our actions. Uh, or for example, uh, this is a what has come to before. And if you consider the future, there should be a tangible diversity, fully-fledged diversity. So in our country, in France, uh, we are facing uh, some problems in terms of diversity. In 2000, 2011, we conducted a memorable uh, action. In 2011, there was this uh, copies Lieberman law. It was uh, deemed to be unacceptable for men and women. People said it's not possible. Women will be highlighted, and it's a matter of using quotas. But I thought it would take a generation, but it took half of a generation uh, today. Uh, there are 50% uh, of women who uh, are part and parcel of a board, but without any laws, we wouldn't have changed. Let's uh, move on with quota, uh, ethnic quotas. Uh, I think that uh, we have to conduct uh, some statistics uh, regarding ethnicity, and most of the time this problem is uh, put under the carpet. But I think that we need to change. We should have a voluntary policy, and the states should do more. Otherwise, things won't change, and this uh, 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 situation will lead to a revolution. 
And what about uh, the regional aspect? I'm delighted to be here uh, in Aix. Uh, uh, this conference conference is not had in Paris, and so much the better. If you want to succeed, you have to go to Paris. If you want to raise funds, you have to go to Paris. That's not true. That's not true. We are creating a generation of people who are not happy. We uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, being um, open-minded because we don't sleep a, a lot. Uh, uh, so when you grew up in X, why do you want to live in Paris? I was with Denis Philippon, an exceptional person, a, a guy from the Southwest, and he launched Voyage Privé. So he launched the company in he launched the company in X, 1.5 billion in terms of revenues. The family is happy and employees are happy too. So for the future, uh, we should uh, promote skills where they are. And we know that uh, a company like Swile, they are based in Montpellier, but we need to encourage a better diversity. Without uh, a diversity, uh, uh, we want to be able to evolve. I mean, one century ago, um, people uh, were all white people, people were Catholic, but that's no longer the case. So we need to understand uh, that uh, uh, pattern. It's a bit of a political message that I'm putting out to you today. So two minutes left, two minutes left. So there are some uh, young people uh, in the room Maybe there are some of them who uh, live uh, uh, at Aix-en-Provence. So any reaction to what uh, Alexandre said? Do you want to stay uh, here? Do you want to uh, earn your keep here in, in X, for example, in order to get uh, a balanced life? Oh, unfortunately, the young people are not from X. I'm from Rennes, but we have a good ecosystem of, uh, of startups. And uh, Marie Francoise, over to you for a conclusion. I will be fast. You've described different experiments and experiences that are very insightful. It's just a small fraction of finance, so we still have a long way to go. I come from a city where there's on where the current cut 40 company is not based in Paris and I can tell you that the first woman to get the uh, prize of economics uh, Mrs Nostrum uh, she got the prize because she talked about the common good. So at the heart of all the actions, you have the state, private companies, local authorities. Alstrom uh, talked about a group. We're not going to manage uh, the world uh, by groups, but groups uh, uh, can uh, appropriate for themselves a, a territory. They will try and find solutions, and they will ask for some funding. And in the future, all these uh, stakeholders, all these uh, players will be able to launch uh, those projects. Thank you. Thank you all.